So you, you've heard already a couple times today about the uh, 50K chip. I just want to make sure everybody's on the, the same uh, page on this. This is 50,000 markers that we evaluate simultaneously on an animal. Uh, they're spread pretty much throughout the genome. And it's become really a, a core tool that we use in studying the genomics of animals, of uh, cattle especially. And um, more recently, there, there's been a chip developed that we call the 770K chip. And you've heard a little bit about that already today. That's 770,000 different positions spread throughout the, uh, the 3 billion or so bases of the bovine genome uh, that we can look at simultaneously on an animal. So it's a pretty powerful tool. We're just getting started with that here at the center. We've genotyped a uh, bit over 300 uh, bulls with it. We're in the process of doing another three or 400. And um, what, what we think is that it's going to allow our predictions to be quite a bit more breed specific than we were able to accomplish with the 50K chip. And uh, as you've already heard, and, and we'll see some more of, um, you know, the fundamental challenge we've had with the 50K results have been that, that they just need to be uh, applied in a breed-specific manner, and we would like to move into a um, technology that doesn't require our predictions to be quite so breed-specific, where we can uh, make predictions that can be applied across a number of breeds. Uh, so we're excited about moving into the... Uh, the data on the 770K chip. Um, Steve talked quite a bit about the, the same concept that's, that's represented in this slide. Uh, basically, we have three different kinds of populations. And we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about this training population. It's sometimes called discovery. I'm going to try to refer to it as training. I think that's what we're mostly using today. But if I slip up and say discovery instead, it's the same as as training. And then we, we know that we need to have a validation population in which to determine whether or not our training was successful. And, and more than determining whether or not it was successful, what we really want to do is to estimate this genetic correlation between the training population and the uh, validation population. And so you've already heard a fair bit about uh, estimating that genetic correlation. Um, but then what we really want to do with the DNA tests are to apply them in another population. And Steve referred to this as evaluation. So, so I think what Steve meant by evaluation is we're doing a genetic evaluation of the breed, and that's where we're applying the uh, DNA testing technology. So although the words seem kind of different, what Steve's saying in evaluation and what I'm saying in application is really the same thing. I'll sometimes maybe slip up and call that our target population. It's the population that we're trying to be able to be successful with with our DNA test. And as Steve said earlier, ideally the genetic relationship, the average pedigree relationship between our training population and validation should be roughly equivalent to the average pedigree relationship between our training population and the target population that we want to apply the test in or the evaluation population. So this is a function of how we want to apply the test. And so in designing a validation population, we want to try to get a population that matches that degree of pedigree relationship as closely as we can. Now, it's often really hard to know uh, whether we've achieved that or not. But as Steve mentioned, the implications of missing that uh, you know, can be fairly serious. And so if the relationship is much closer between training and validation than it is between training and, and application, the implication is the test is not going to work as well as what we 
think it is, it's not going to work as well as we've claimed it is. If we've used the correlation that we estimate up here to set up a genetic evaluation system in which we incorporate the DNA test, and this relationship is closer than this one is, then we're going to put too much emphasis in the genetic evaluation on the, on the genomics information. On the other hand, we don't want to go to extremes in trying to separate training from validation. If we really wanted to say, let's just make them unrelated, and that's what we said a couple years ago. We talked a lot about let's get an independent, completely independent population to use for validation. Well, a, a really unrelated population would be just let's go to a different breed. And what we found is if we just go to a different breed, it really doesn't work very well. But if we really think about it, that's not what we're trying to do with the primary application that we're focusing on first, which is within breed selection. So for a within breed selection, saying that the validation population is just a different breed is, is also not the appropriate thing to do. It sets the bar too high, and as I'm going to show you, the challenges are great enough without setting the bar higher than it needs to be. And, and so, you know, we really do ourselves a disservice if we pick a validation population that's too far removed from training, because then if we, if we estimate a low genetic correlation between these and we put it into genetic evaluation, then we won't put enough emphasis on the, on the DNA information, and that's uh, potentially just as bad as, as putting too much em emphasis on the DNA information. So it, it's pretty important that we try to get this right, and it's not as easy to do as it seems like it should be. Uh, for most of the commercial tests, we don't really know what the training population is, so there's no way to estimate either the relationship between training and application or between training and validation. So, so that's a real challenge for us. I want to think about several different kinds of uh, tr discovery or training populations. And one that we have uh, seen a lot of success with so far is just let's put together a population of a single breed, and they're purebred animals, and generally we're talking about AI sires that have high accuracy genetic evaluations. And, and we know that this has been uh, done fairly successful for a couple of breeds. The downside is that it requires an awful lot of genotypes on high accuracy AI bulls, and for a lot of breeds, we're not going to have that large number of, uh, of sires genotyped either because of the cost of genotyping large numbers of sires, or in some breeds, just simply because there's not enough sires within the breed that, that have a lot of accuracy and are not um, extraordinarily highly related to one another, um, that, that it's just going to be challenging to cover the whole breed with high accuracy AI sires. That'd be more of a problem in breeds that, that use less AI. So another approach would be to use purebreds of a lot of different breeds. And Larry discussed with you a bit the, the 2,000 bulls population. And, and we've used uh, this approach at the Meat Animal Research Center. And then another approach would be to train in crossbred animals. And we've also used this approach fairly extensively, and I'll explain both of those in a little bit more detail as we go on through this. But then there's also different kinds of data that we can collect, in terms of the phenotypes, the actual measurements that we make on cattle. And a lot of the, the training that's been done has been done with AI sires that have high accuracy EPDs. And so if this is the model that we're using, then the phenotypes that we're training on are actually the EPDs of these bulls, and hopefully they're high accuracy bulls. In practice, we wind up with a mixture of bulls that are high accuracy and medium accuracy, and probably even some low accuracy bulls mixed in. 
And so there's some statistical approaches that we have to do to account for the difference in accuracy. We call it deregressing the EPDs. I'm not going to dwell on that more. Uh, but this is one approach, and, and it has some advantages. One of the advantages is that you get a lot of phenotypic information relative to the number of genotypes that you have to pay for. But it's limited to those traits that we have EPDs in genetic evaluation for. So the other approach is that we use individuals that have their own phenotypes. And so as you might guess, one of the advantages of taking this approach is that we can get into some traits where phenotypes are very expensive and maybe even more expensive than the genotypes. And so that, that's illustrated here where we have a group of crossbred cattle that are on an individual feed intake system. And in this case, collecting the phenotype is actually more expensive than collecting the, the genotype. And so this approach is more efficient for these traits that are not in genetic evaluation. And so as we go forward, there's going to be a place for each of these different kinds of populations. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about the two populations that we have at US Mark. And one of those is a group of animals from our germplasm evaluation population. Larry talked about this in the last presentation. Uh, this is a breed evaluation population in which we sample a, a, a large number of breeds. Um, and basically here we're working with phenotypes on the, on the individual itself that we're genotyping. Um, and so we would include phenotypes that are not included in the genetic evaluation system. The other population that we've worked with quite a bit is what we call our 2,000 bulls project. And I think the next slide describes that. Um, we, we basically agreed with 16 breed associations that if they would provide us with uh, semen to use as a DNA source, that we would run the 50K genotypes on these bulls. Uh, some of these bulls were part of our germplasm evaluation project already at the time that we sampled these bulls. There are other bulls that uh, were first sampled for the 2,000 bulls, and then subsequently we chose them for a more recent sample in the germplasm evaluation project. And so there's a fair bit of overlap between these 2,000 bulls and our germplasm evaluation sample. And, and that'll become relevant in, in a moment as well. But the, the basic idea of this project was Let's look at 50K genotypes on a couple thousand bulls that are uh, highly influential in the beef industry. So the goals of the project were to demonstrate feasibility and understand challenges of applying whole genome selection in beef cattle. We've probably learned a little more about challenges in applying it than we had hoped to, but, uh, but we are learning a lot. We wanted to provide prediction equations for uh, general use and to provide genetic predictions for the bulls in the project. And in order to do that, we needed to determine how well are the predictions that we're generating working. And the approach that we've used to do that primarily uh, within the Meat Animal Research Center is what I'm going to refer to as cross-validation. So, so basically, we train on the animals from our germplasm evaluation project. And then we say, well, how well can we predict the EPDs of the 2,000 bulls? So, so this is our validation population. And then we can also do the reverse. We can train on the 2,000 bulls and then ask, how well do we predict the phenotypes of the GPE population? And so that's a, a real nice approach to looking at uh, cross-validation. It requires that we're dealing with traits that are measured on both populations. We, we have essentially all of the EPD traits measured on, on our cattle, but that means we're, we're basically are limited to those EPD traits that are um, routinely measured and submitted in large numbers and that a lot of these breeds have EPDs for. So we basically are looking at growth and carcass traits or what we can do this with. 
but, but then we, we need to look, think back about that issue of how is the discovery population related to the validation population relative to how is the discovery population related to a target population. And what we've kind of settled on is a, an ad hoc uh, standard that we like to, to be able to use when possible is that if we were going to take if we we're going to apply a DNA test that say that was trained on these 2,000 bulls in the industry, Steve already told you that it doesn't really add a lot of value to have a DNA test that you can go out and use on another AI sire and do a really good job of predicting another AI sire. That, that AI sire, assuming that he's a highly proven AI sire, already has a high accuracy EPD, the DNA test really has no hope of improving the accuracy of a really high accuracy bull. So what we really want to do with the DNA test is to sort out maybe sons of these AI sires and grandsons of these AI sires. That's where the real application of DNA testing in the seed stock industry lies. So what we like to do is when we're training on the 2,000 bulls, we like to exclude those, that subset of the 2,000 bulls that sired our GPE cattle. So we just take those bulls out of the 2,000 bull project, train on those, and then predict over here. And we feel like that gives us about the right degree of separation. And then likewise, when we're training over here and predicting here, that training is a little bit close to the AI sires that produce this population, so we take them out over here when we do the validation. So the GPE sires get dropped from the 2,000 bulls when we're, when we're doing this cross-validation approach. So here are the genetic correlations that we get in each direction. So we have two lines here we have green bars and blue bars. The green are trained on the mark or GPE population and validated on the 2,000 bulls. And the, the blue bars are trained on the 2,000 bulls and validated on GPE. These genetic correlations are not as high as we would like for them to be. Um, but we're, we're doing, we're, we have a little more challenging problem here in that we're predicting multiple breeds and we're training on multiple breeds. Um, but I, you know, I think that we're, we're approaching getting to where we want to be on, on some of the traits. Uh, you'll notice that we do better for the, for the growth traits when we train on, um, 2,000 bulls, actually, that, you know, so I'm going to have to take that back. That's not right here. Okay, well, I'll, I'll skip that point. Because that, <laughs> <laughs> those, those numbers have changed since the analysis at which I drew that conclusion. Um, but typically, we've seen that we do better when we when we train on, uh, use the EPDs for training on the growth traits, and when we use the, uh, the mark data, which is more carcass intensive for training on the carcass traits. But that doesn't seem to be what's in this version of the analysis. Um, so I've presented the, the genetic correlations. Uh, that, that's what everybody seems to present routinely. Um, as you'll see in a moment, there's a reason why everybody likes to present the genetic correlations as opposed to the proportion of genetic variation that we account for. Um, this is the proportion of genetic variation. Th this, as Steve and, uh, and Matt indicated earlier, is really the more relevant uh, value to look at. It's how much 
of what's out there to be predicted are we accounting for with our DNA test. So it's numerically the square of the genetic correlation. And, you know, so obviously if you're selling a, gen a DNA test, you present the genetic correlation, you don't present the proportion of variation. Uh, but we, we feel this is really the, uh, the scale on which we need to look at these things. So obviously there's some room for improvement here, but, but we have gotten some good news in the last few days. And we've, we've taken the, both of the predictions uh, that we had and looked at them on the, uh, the weight trait project, which, which Matt's uh, described to you earlier and which you're gonna hear more about. Um, and we see that we're, we're actually accounting for uh, higher levels of, uh, of genetic variance, although it's, it's fairly variable from breed to breed. Um, but there's some challenges in, in this data. So, so all of this data is trained on the 2,000 bulls. Um, when, we tr when we trained on the 2,000 bulls, and then we wanted to look at how this was working in the weight traits project. We didn't genotype the, the calves that were phenotyped in the weight traits project. We genotyped their sires. And so we've got a set of sires that are natural service sires that, that Matt got genotyped through a, through a grant that he got. But then there's also a lot of contribution of the 2,000 bulls to that project. So, we, we've analyzed this with the 2,000 bulls in the analysis, which is this line that says full, which is in green. But then we took out the 2,000 bulls, and that's what we're calling reduced here, which is the yellow bars. So generally, we do quite a bit better if we have the 2,000 bulls in. That's probably a higher degree of relationship than we're really comfortable with. Um, but for some applications of DNA testing, that's, that's probably a, a reasonable degree of relationship to have. Um, as is typically the case, we don't really know right now exactly what that average degree of relationship is. But if we put all of the bulls in, the standard errors, which are indicated by these bars that go up in these little lines that go up and down above the bars, if we have the 2,000 bulls in, we, we have pretty good predictive power to know what the proportion of variation is. The real thing that we're struggling with here is when we take the 2,000 bulls out and look at these yellow lines, the predictions are a lot more variable than, so the yellow ones are a lot more variable than the green ones are, and these standard errors can be really large. And what that's saying is there just aren't enough sires there to do a good job of estimating that genetic correlation or to estimate what the proportion of variation that we're accounting for is. You know, we're, we're pretty encouraged by some of these that are, that are up into the range that we think we need to be in. Uh, obviously, there's some others that, that don't look so good. And, and in one case, the uh, correlation was actually in the wrong direction which is disconcerting. But, you know, it, when we put all the bulls in, it's good. And the, the real thing, we don't get too worried about having a negative one because the standard error on it was really big. So it's not really different from zero. Um, so, so I think we're, we're encouraged by opportunities to improve the process. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, to improve the results that we've gotten. Certainly we can add more animals with, with phenotypes and with genotypes, and we're in the process of doing that. We're continuously producing more animals with, with phenotypes, and we've just made a commitment to do a lot more genotyping, and that's gonna add a lot more um, animals that have both, and that, that's gonna improve our power quite a bit. We can increase marker density, and, and we're using the 770K chip to do that, and we're hopeful that that's going to 
help both with our within breed predictive power, but but maybe more importantly, make these predictions a bit less um, breed specific. And then we we will be collecting a complete DNA sequence on uh, about 96 individual bulls in the next few months, and and would intend to do uh, considerably more animals uh, going into the future. And I think that having this uh, information at the DNA sequence level is also going to, um, well really it's, it's increasing marker density to the point that, that we really can't increase it very much more beyond that. So um, we, we think that's going to add a lot to our predictions. And then we think there's still an awful lot that we can do from a statistical perspective to extract more information from the data that we have. And um, so we, we have a lot of ideas of how to do that and, um, and I think we'll, we'll be successful with that as well. Uh, so to wrap up, the, we, we know that within breed predictions based on the 50K can work pretty well. Allison showed you some results to support that earlier. Um, you know, training on multiple purebred populations um, has been shown elsewhere to be more effective than training on just one single small population. I think that when we can put together a big single breed population, that's a really great solution. But it's not practical across the whole beef industry. So we're, we're pretty well convinced that if we can draw on information from all of the data that's available, we'll do a better job in the end than um, trying to train on just, just a single breed at a time. And I, I think that as we increase marker density, these crossbred populations are likely to become increasingly important components of our training. They, they actually provide us with some information that we can't get out of the purebred populations. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions that you might have.